Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's, uh, it's lovely to see so many of you here to uh, celebrate the launch of our new national strategy. Um, unfortunately, I'm sorry that before we start, I've got to give you some health and safety information. So if you'll just bear with me for a minute. Um, the fire assembly point for the building is at number 12 Hill Square, which is where we came in, I think. And the nearest fire exit route is located at the main entrance where we came in. There's a ramp access to the building if you need this and a lift to the auditorium, but you're here now, so I guess you all know that. Um, and there's also an evacuation chair available in the building. And that's all uh, for that. Um, and now um, my notes say that I have to see, say that I'm glad to see so many of you here. And I can't believe that there are so many of you here, not only for this moment, but for breakfast at nine o'clock in Edinburgh. Well done, everyone. It's lovely to see you. And of course, it's not just uh, sector people who are here today. We've got many of our partner organisations as well. Um, and we've got people online. So a very warm welcome to them too. Uh, and a particularly warm wel welcome to our Minister, Mr Neil Gray, who is the Minister for Culture, Europe and International Development and other things too, but he said I can call it, <laughs> I can call his title there and here and after referred to as the Minister. <laughs> it's lovely to see you here, you're, you're very welcome and it's good of you to give us your time when we know you're so busy. <clears throat> Um, now, um, I did say that it was wonderful to see people here from so many different organisations, um, and it is surprising how many uh, partnerships we do have um, along culture, heritage, tourism, education, climate and social organisations. So it's, it's a very, very wide network that we have. And the range and breadth of the audience today reflects the huge potential that there lies in museums and galleries to work with others and to improve in quality, the quality of life for people all across Scotland. Um, so we're not on our own. Um, and we've also just completed some research into tourism and how important uh, the museum and gallery sector is to that. Um, not just because people um, come to Scotland to visit our museums and galleries, but also because people want to know about our history and our background and so on. Um, and it's, we, are, we are capable of and are making a huge contribution to tourism and the visitor economy. And it's precisely this wide range of participants from across our sector of 450 museums and galleries and from our partners and stakeholders that, we've, that has developed this, this strategy. Um, everyone has been consulted and no doubt consulted several times over um, to produce the work that we now have before us today. And of course, this is the second strategy um, for Scotland's museums and galleries that, that we've, we've produced. Um, and this one builds on the achievements of going further which guided our collective work from 2012 to 2022. Um, and you may remember we launched the last chapter of that just days before the COVID breakdown. And at that time I said, um, so much has happened since 2012. Well, my goodness, what a lot has happened <laughs> uh, in the last three years too. But um, going further, it wasn't just that it was um, the first national strategy for museums and galleries in Scotland. It was the first of its kind in the UK at that time. And of course, it was fully endorsed by the Scottish government and supported uh, fully all through the, the course of its preparation. But the real game, game changer at the time was that the strategy united the sector uh, in purpose and ambition. And it stood the test of time because it was produced by the sector for the sector and was the result of an extensive consultation exercise as this one has been too. And its key achievement was to encourage collaboration and unite the sector behind a shared vision. Our new strategy benefits from the experience and it too has been written with and for all of Scotland's museums and galleries. It aims to ensure that all of these inspiring organisations and the collections that they care for will be accessed, shared and enjoyed by the people of Scotland for generations to come. Through uh, the consultation of the last year, our sector has set a new, we've, we've um, produced a new shared vision. And it is for museums and galleries to be thriving, connected and resilient organisations which are agile in embracing change, trusted and valued by the widest diversity of Scotland's people, our collections 
and the shared stories we tell, and they are accessible and inclusive to all. In fact, to me, what's so heartening about this vision is how much of it is already underway and how much of it is instantly recognisable as our priorities for the future. We know from the last strategy going further how innovative and resilient our museums and galleries can be. The timing of this strategy is important too. It's been produced <clears throat> at a time when the sector faces awful challenges. You know, it's never been as bad, we think, anyway, and um, possibly not since the, the Second World War. Um, even COVID, uh, was, we got through, um, but now we've got more and more challenges ahead of us. But what this means is that the strategy provides us with a roadmap to follow so that we can address and overcome all the challenges that we face together. The consultations with the sector in developing the strategy have provided Museums Gallery Scotland itself with an overview of the realities that faces, as well as the ambitions. The strategy seeks to balance reality with ambition, and there are three driving forces that have shaped what is being launched today. The first is that we need to become more inclusive organisations. We must understand and respond to the needs of all who currently experience bar barriers to accessing and working in our museums and galleries. The Empire, Slavery and Scotland's Museums Research and Recommendations highlighted our responsibility to operate as anti-racist organisations, telling stories that involve diverse perspectives and acknowledging and addressing barriers within organisational cultures so that we can build inclusive workplaces that support and attract in a much more a diverse or a, 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 diver, a workforce as diverse as it can be. This work is important in order to ensure that our museums and galleries really are for everyone. The second driving force is that we must act with urgency on the climate emergency. Museums and galleries have a role to play here in how we operate and how we use our role as trusted organisations who help to advise and inform the public and um, make, uh, make sure that we can make a contribution to the, the national ambition to reach the target uh, of net zero by 2045. And the final driving force that we face is that we have an ongoing financial crisis. There is no doubt that the energy and cost of living issues on top of the aftermath of the pandemic pose serious challenges for all of us. However, the pandemic was also another demonstration of the adaptability of museums and galleries and showed how much we strive to find ways to engage with communities and how we can play a central role as a welcoming, open, accessible space. The pandemic demonstrated how vital cultural life is to the public, especially when times are tough. And they're tough for museums and galleries, as, as, as well as for all the communities that are around about us. During these times, we've seen museums and galleries finding creative, innovative ways of sharing and using their collective uh, collections during the lockdown. In doing so, they helped alleviate the negative impacts of social isolation for vulnerable groups. Museums and galleries helped to improve the overall well-being of the general public and continued to provide access to culture and learning through targeted programming and outreach that brought people together during the lockdown. Our passionate and dedicated workforce, including our many volunteers, upskilled, particularly in digital communication and campaigns that broadened and created alliances through partnership working. Our business support programme has been particularly successful in this. This programme facilitates skills sharing, making efficient use of resources and builds workforce resilience. And that in turn, increases the capacity to make impact, positive impacts for the public. <clears throat> Partnership delivery has been woven into the actions and subsequent outcomes for the sector and has provided a platform for Museums Gallery Scotland to create an ecosystem that helps shape and support our activity. 
During this morning's session, you see the tables all laid out for the next bit, um, we're going to hear more about the strategy with its three intertwined stands of connection, resilience and workforce. We'll be hearing from a panel of experts, both from within the sector and from our partners, and they'll share their ideas on how the strategy can inspire the making of, um, can inspire us to, to make use of all the opportunities that will arise for co collaboration. The strategy has been developed in alignment with those of our culture and heritage partners to ensure that Scotland's museums are contributing to the wider frameworks, including United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, Scotland's National Performance Framework and Scotland's Culture Strategy. So today is a chance to recalibrate, refocus and reprioritise in a new social and economic context, a chance to learn from and take inspiration from one another. But importantly, it's also a chance to recognise and celebrate the positive impact which our sector has had and will continue to have in the future. It is, however, all very new. And so to help uh, us all get a better idea of the work that lies ahead, we've actually prepared a short film to introduce the new strategy. And so we are going to show it now. It's just two minutes. Museums and galleries are vibrant threads in the fabric of Scottish society. They connect the people of Scotland to their communities, their environment, and their place in the world. They strengthen our culture, encourage tourism, and enrich our lives. But the world around us is changing with new challenges, ideas, and ways of working. To stay relevant, Scotland's museums and galleries must aspire to be trusted, valued, and enterprising spaces. They must contribute to our collective well-being, education, and sense of identity. They must care for Scotland's collections and be accessible and inclusive to all. The new strategy sets out how museums and galleries can realise this vision. Written with and for Scotland's museum sector, it will enable us to achieve our shared aims. At the heart of this strategy are three strands. Connection, resilience and workforce. The connection strand supports us to have a wider impact on our communities and enables us to reach and represent all audiences. Resilience highlights how we can embrace change in collaborative and resourceful ways. And Workforce underscores the importance of creating jobs and workplaces which are fair and fulfilling for all. These three strands are interwoven. Investing in our workforce provides our people with the skills and confidence to connect with their communities, which in turn helps us build a more resilient sector. This is a strategy for all of Scotland's museums and galleries, big and small, urban and rural. Each organisation will have different priorities and will be working to different levels depending on their size and strengths. The successful delivery of the strategy will ensure that Scotland's museums and galleries are thriving, connected and resilient organisations that share collections and stories which are accessible and inclusive to all. Right, there's now going to be a competition to see how many of those museums that you can all recognise. <laughs> have you got them? Um, so we can look forward to hearing about uh, the priority areas and how Museums Gallery Scotland will support the work of the sector later this morning. So I've just got one more thing to do, which is that I want to take the opportunity um, to thank Scottish Government for its continued support and particularly financial support, and particularly during the pandemic when we really did manage to keep uh, museums uh, uh, living uh, and surviving the pandemic. The money was 
much needed and extremely welcome. Uh, and also thank you for being so involved in the production of this strategy. And as I said earlier, we're very pleased that the Minister is able to be with us today. And could I invite him to come on to the lectern, up to the lectern? And can I say, you can't see very well. I, <laughs> I apologise for my summary. I can't, there's no light here. But, I, but do please come up and, uh, and uh, say a few words. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ray, for your warm, uh, passionate uh, and pertinent uh, words of, of introduction. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, like Ray, I am absolutely delighted to be able to see uh, so many people uh, here this morning in person. Uh, it's still a novelty that's not uh, lost on me, the ability for us to have a room full of people uh, to discuss such an important uh, issue. Uh, the online environment has been useful. I've been able to have many meetings with Ray and Lucy and, and other colleagues uh, online, but I, th I don't think there's any substitute for the ability to be here in person. So I thank those uh, who have travelled uh, here today, including uh, Paul Sweeney, MSP, who's come through from the West, uh, but my uh, former school friend Katie from, uh, from the, uh, the Stromness Museum, who's travelled all the way down from Orkney. I'm sure there are other colleagues. There's a Shetland Orkney um, competition. Um, so I don't know if there are any Shelties in the audience, but I'm very grateful for the fact that we have an Arcadian uh, here with us and all of you uh, other, uh, here uh, as well, representing uh, the fantastic array of museums and galleries and the sector in general here in Scotland of which we are incredibly proud. Uh, Ray has uh, very helpfully and clearly outlined the vision and strands uh, of the new strategy and uh, how they interlink. The strands of workforce, connection uh, and resilience give a clear indication of the current priorities of the sector that the strategy builds itself around. Uh, I was really pleased uh, that this strategy has been developed by uh, and for the sector. It is encouraging to learn about more about uh, how the many consultations that were had throughout the strategy's development. It's also encouraging to hear Ray speak of the benefits the previous strategy had. Uh, I find the resulting new strategy to be a helpful and clear document that charts the key priorities for the next seven years, and I hope that you all do too. Like Ray, I'm thinking about the last few years and the difficult challenges we've all faced uh, but how we managed to come through them and the opportunities that now await us over the next seven uh, as part of this strategy. This event also provides the perfect opportunity to celebrate the unique contribution museums make to our diverse communities across Scotland. There could be no doubt that for a nation of our size, Scotland certainly has a, di a diverse uh, and impressive wealth of heritage and culture. And this is amply represented uh, in uh, everything our excellent museums offer to the people of Scotland uh, and to so many who visit our country for our cultural and heritage offerings. Uh, since my appointment as Minister for Culture, Europe, uh, International Development and Minister with Special Responsibility for Refugees from Ukraine, I'm very grateful that it has offered me and afforded me the opportunity to visit many of these unique at museums, some of which we saw on the film, and I'll attempt to recount some of those that I've been able to visit in a, pr a personal and a, a, and a professional capacity over uh, the last few years. Uh, I've had the opportunity to visit the dynamic new offering at the Burrell uh, Collection. I've also visited the inspiring local museums, uh, such as the Torontium Museum in Melrose. Both of these visits really showed me how vital uh, museum spaces can be to local communities. Uh, we also saw in the film the likes of the Highland Folk Museum in Newton Moor, uh, the National Museum uh, of Scotland, uh, the, the Burns Museum, Summer Lee, the Scottish Football Museum, all of which I've been really fortunate to be able to visit. Uh, some of which contained in there are my children's own favourites, but I'll, I'll not let you in the secret as to which one it is. We love them all. Um, uh, but I look forward to being able to visit many more. My diary secretary, my private secretary, is not here today, so today's the day to get bids in to try and <laughs> fit that into um, my, my diary, which is uh, a constant mess as I try to get along to as much as possible. Uh, but really looking forward to visiting... Uh, many more uh, museums in the future and to learn more about how they really bring our history and culture alive to new audiences. The importance of our local heritage to communities across Scotland must never be taken for granted and this is drawn out in the connection strand uh, of the new strategy, ensuring 
we can deliver equality of access for everyone should be a fundamental to all museums. And museums should also be spaces which are as inclusive and accessible as possible, as Ray outlined, and I absolutely endorse how the new strategy reflects this priority. Museum objects tell many fascinating stories, giving people an insight into their world and culture. Some of these stories present more complex and challenging aspects. And this is what I find fascinating about museums' collections. They tell the most interesting human stories. And I really believe it's important we tell more of Scotland's diverse stories. The Empire and Slavery in Scotland's Museums Report is a really important example of how we could do this. And I'm really grateful for all the work that went in uh, to the report and the extensive public consultation. I'll be making a supportive response to that report, which will resonate, I hope, with the connection uh, and workforce strands of this strategy. Uh, indeed, ensuring a skilled and diverse workforce is crucial for the future needs of and the resilience of the sector. Uh, I fully endorse the priority set out in the workforce uh, strand in the strategy around fair work, diversity, skills and confidence. Investing in the workforce is one very important aspect of the action we need to take for the resilience of museums in the current financial uh, and cost of living crisis in the current economic climate. Given the cost of living challenges and the tough financial situation we are all in, we have to prioritise activity uh, that is going to create a more resilient and sustainable sector. And with resilience challenges in mind, I'm really pleased, I'm delighted uh, to be able to announce today that an additional £500,000 of capital funding will be provided to Museums and Galleries Scotland. Uh, this funding will be to increase resilience in the museum sector, including enabling more energy efficiency projects uh, to be funded. And I want to take a moment to recognise the key role that Museums Gallery Scotland plays in supporting the museum sector in Scotland and to thank them for the work that they continue to do. In the regular discussions I have with uh, MGS, it's clear that they are passionate and uh, about championing the sector and uh, Lucy and her team do a really great job ensuring they understand the challenges and opportunities that you face and also keeping me informed of these. The Scottish Government continues to recognise the important contribution uh, that the museum sector can and will deliver, deliver to our communities and to our national priorities, uh, including our, the economy, our journey to net zero and our health and well-being. The increased funding for resilience will assist the sector to be more sustainable, ensure it is better able to address these priorities. And it's important to continue to draw out and communicate these examples of what museums do. So I look forward to hearing from Lucy and Ray how the new strategy delivers for Scotland's museums. And I would like to conclude by expressing my sincere thanks to Lucy, Sai and Enya for organising this launch event and to everyone here today uh, for your enthusiasm, commitment uh, and support for Scotland's museums. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Minister, um, for your hugely supportive words uh, and for all your support for Museums Gallery Scotland and, of course, for Scotland's amazing museums and galleries. Um, we are, of course, absolutely delighted uh, with the announcement of the additional capital funding, uh, and which is going to help us to respond to the huge demand from the sector and enable more museums to increase their resilience. Thank you also to Ray for, for launching the strategy today, and thank you as well from me to everyone online and in person who's joined us here today for this launch event. Now, it's almost time for our panel session where we'll be exploring some of the priority areas within the strategy and discussing within more depth with our panel of experts who are waiting to come to the stage. But just before I introduce our panel, I want to draw your attention to the appearance of the knot on the screen, which you may have spotted and wondering what that's all about. So this design represents the three, stream, three themes, themes? The three themes of the strategy uh, and how they are interwoven with each strand and priority area intrinsically linked to each other rather than standing as separate in entities. So I'm delighted to introduce a short animated video that we've created to help explain the strategy strands and the priorities that are going to inform our collective work to 2030. If we could play that. Scotland's Museums and Galleries strategy centres around three strands. Connection resilience and workforce. 
These three strands highlight how Scotland's museums and galleries will create impact and connection for the people and places of Scotland, the need to invest in the resilience of our sector and to value the workforce who care for and bring our collections and spaces alive. The strands intertwine. Investing in our workforce is integral to us developing the skills and confidence to make connections and ensure the resilience of our sector. At the strategy's core is the need to ensure that Scotland's museum and gallery collections are cared for, accessible and shared. Consultation with the museum sector workforce identified 10 priority areas, which, as a sector, we need to focus on collectively. These priority areas are grouped under the three strands of connection, workforce and resilience. As the three strands are interlinked, the priority areas link too, so development across all areas of the strategy will help realise the strategy's vision. To find out more, visit the Museums Gallery Scotland website. It includes funding and workforce development opportunities, case studies, blogs and advice guides. Pages are tagged by strategy priority areas to make it easy to find ideas, inspiration and support. The MGS team are also here to help. Explore the strategy further by visiting museumsgallerysscotland.org.uk forward slash strategy dash hub. I hope that that's a helpful little film just to help visualise how that strategy is going to work in practice. Now, I'm now delighted to invite our panel to come to the stage and join me. Uh, and we're going to explore um, four of the ten priority areas in more detail. Would you like to come and join us? Brilliant. So the panel, we're going to discuss um, four of the priority areas of the strategy. We'll discuss fair work, which is a priority within the workforce strand, then inclusion, followed by place, which both sit within the connection strand, and finally we're going to close with the climate strand within the resilience. These priority areas have been chosen as they're areas that have particularly strong elements of collaboration and interlinkage. They're also areas that have strong alignment with the work of our partners and funders, as well as with Scottish Government, policy and national and social and economic outcomes. We'll open the discussion with Mike Benson, who will speak about Fair Work. Mike is the director of the Scottish Cranog Centre, which is a brilliant example of an organisation that leads on the practicalities of implementing Fair Work practices in museums and galleries. Mike is an experienced museum professional with a long-standing history of expertise in Fair Work, acting as a strong advocate for the sector in this area, particularly drawing out the importance of creating inclusive workplaces where all experience is valued. Next, we're going to have Nelson Cummins, who's uh, the Communities and Campaign Officer at the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights, and Nelson will introduce the inclusion priority area. Nelson's part of one of the organisations, one of many the partners that we'll collaborate with in delivering the strategy. Nelson's role focuses on coordinating work on Black History Month, and he's strongly embedded in taking this forward within communities in Glasgow. Nelson was also one of the community curators on the award-winning Curating Discomfort Project at the Hunterian Museum, which highlighted how we can reinterpret collections to question and challenge harmful ideologies connected to Scotland's history of colonialism and slavery. We will then welcome Diane Gray, Head of Engagement at the National Lottery Heritage Fund in Scotland, who will speak on place. The Heritage Fund have been a huge supporter of Scotland's museums and galleries and are a key partner in numerous projects. Diane's work focuses on engaging with places and communities that are underserved providing advice to projects seeking to explore and celebrate heritage, and building partnerships to sustain and grow the contribution of culture in our communities. In particular, Diane will focus on the felt experience of the place-based approach and how that links with building inclusivity and encouraging diversity within our sector. And last, but by no means least, we have Katie Firth speaking to Climate Resilience in Action. Katie is part of the collections development team at Stromness Museum, which is one of Scotland's oldest independent museums. I'm pretty sure gets the prize for having traveled the furthest for today. Katie brings a strong fo sector focus on why climate action is so relevant and important for museums and galleries, not just from a social justice point of view, but from co-creating partnerships and relationships with the local community. 
Katie's passion for the outdoors, particularly marine life, informs the work that, Scott, that Stromness Museum have carried out using their collections to help start conversations about climate change and inform community outreach programming. So in bringing together two people who are working within museums and two for partner organisations, our panel exemplifies the collaboration across and beyond the sector that's going to be central to the successful delivery of the strategy. So I hope you'll enjoy the session very much. And um, just one more practicality. There will be time at the end um, for questions um, uh, for the panel. We're using the web-based app Slido for this to collate questions. And we're using Slido so that people in the room and people online can both contribute questions at the same time. That's why I have my screen in front of me. So you may have seen a QR code to scan as you arrived, which brings you to a Slido link where you can input your questions. And online attendees should have received that link with their joining instructions. Uh, you can also uh, access it by going to slido.com and entering the hash code on the screen. Is the hash code on the screen? Is that there? Okay, I can't see it, but that's brilliant. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you can also ask questions using your name or anonymously. If we can't get through all of the questions just now, um, there will be more time for questions available at the end of the morning. Uh, that will just be questions to, to the Museums Gallery Scotland team. So if you have questions for the panel, we'll prioritise those just now. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Mike to introduce the Fair Work strand. Thanks, Mike. Morning. Am I live? Yep. Good. I am alive. That's good. <laughs> Doesn't feel like that sometimes. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, as Lucy said, my name is Mike Benson uh, from the Scottish Cranog Centre. I'm going to talk briefly about fair work. I think if, if we are going to be playing our part in a fairer Scotland, um, a more progressive place to be, which is why lots of us choose to live here, um, fair work is fundamental. It's not a nice to have or something we should be doing or, or particularly noble even. It's just a fundamental. Um, so obviously fulfilment, uh, respect, opportunity, security and effective voice, which is in the framework, are important. Um, they are just the start for 10. They are just the, the start of the conversation of how we can actually build fair work. Effective voice is not just about uh, the staff happiness survey or the staff forum. It's a day-to-day -day conversation that needs to happen between everybody uh, within that organisation, big and small. Um, I don't buy the idea that only small places can work this way. Um, so we align that framework, if you like, with different ways of recruiting, different ways of connecting to people into the workplace, into the museum sector, and then you create a diverse workforce. If you have a diverse, diverse workforce and fair work, you, you then can engage better, I would suggest, I would argue, experience tells me that I'm right, uh, with diverse audiences in better ways, in more meaningful ways. Um, and again, that, that is, is something that happens every, every day. And we, we at work, um, we have a, a term called uh, feltness. And it's where, we, where people can feel that freedom of self that the, that the workforce have at work, where everybody's contributing in their own ways, in a way that suits them best, in a way that their talents can be unleashed and their interests unleashed with this diverse workforce. And that feltness is felt internally. It's felt by our, our visitors. So all, all of the evaluation, all the conversations we have with folks that come to see us is around, it's the, it's the staff, it's the workforce, it's the people here that make it every time. And, and people, when they come to see us, see people like themselves. Our workforce represents the communities that we're serving. Um, and we're, 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 it, it, it's simple, really. Uh, we're simple, it's a simple approach, it kind of works. Um, and we work hard. And, and you can feel it, it's like great good places. You can go in 10 hospitals, 10 schools, 10 pubs, but there's always that one that's just that little bit special. It's got that feltness. I don't know if there's a word called feltness. I'll, I'll check later. Um, so, that, so there we go. And, that, and that feltness is, is, is felt by our, our strategic partners as well. So whether it's uh, the UNESCO chair and Rila, refugee integration through language and arts, whether it's Women Aids Perth, whether it's Glasgow Association for Mental Health, or whether it's the Academy, our four strategic partners, they all tell us that they work differently with us they work in a more meaningful, creative way than us, and we, and we achieve more together because of that way of working. Um, I'm going to quote one of our stakeholders, Marcus. Um, we've, we've tried to do some work around actually what we, to articulate this, because I'm not very good at articulating stuff, apart from saying the word feltness. And he said, he said it's the, the, the Cranog Centre, uh, the museum itself, is a, it's a hard place to feel uncomfortable. 
And I thought that was a really, really, really great, he says, and the, the risks of the way of work are nothing, and yet the benefits are huge. And uh, I think that's, that's for us. And I'll, and I'll close, I think, just, there were strikes yesterday, and it's not always about the money. You know, my partner works for Scottish Government. It's not all about the money. It's, a, it's, about, it's about fair work and being treated in a way that, that, is, that you would expect. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Mike, and I know the MGS team are huge fans of, of the way that you work, and it is a very, very special place, and, and it's that unpicking, um, that, that approach to, you, you describe it as a very simple thing, and yet replicating it elsewhere is not something that, we've, that, that everyone's managing to do, so I'm sure there's more we can do to try and unpick that. I have one question, and I'm wondering, how does, or perhaps I should say does, having a national strategy that sets a priority around fair work help to embed that, and maybe to say, does it help to have a national strategy and a shared vision to, to do this? I, I, yeah, it do, it, yeah, it does help because it gives us a, I think it's very said, it gives us a roadmap, it gives us something to measure ourselves against, it, it encourages the right conversations within the sector. I think that's key, and I think the influences from, from the centre, if you like, from yourselves pushing outwards, will, will create those conversations where we can all benefit from learning from each other. And, and challenging each other. We don't challenge each other enough, uh, in my view, uh, to, to get to these points. And so I think I, I, was, um, I was excited when I saw, excited, I was pleased, I was excited, I was chuffed um, that fair work is there because it's, if, 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 if the fair work element is there, nothing is there. Nothing is there. Seriously, we've, if, if, if within organisations, if leaders and, and the, the organisations and aren't working in a fair way, then they aren't doing the jobs. And I think this will, this will help test that. Brilliant. Thanks, Mike. Uh, does anyone else on the panel want to pick up on anything Mike said? Or we can have a discussion at the end if you prefer. Okay. We'll so yeah. thank you very much, uh, Mike. Uh, and we'll take the questions together at the end. So we'll move on uh, and invite Nelson to speak about the inclusion priority. Yeah. Um, yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's lovely to be with you. Um, so before... <coughs> I uh, go into a bit more uh, detail around the inclusion priority. I thought it was really important to sort of set the scene and set the scene in terms of why discussions around inclusion are so important. Um, I'm going to do that through the frame of discussing anti-racism because uh, we're an anti-racist charity and that's where our expertise lies. Um, so in Scotland, if you're minority ethnic, you're more likely to experience poverty. You're more likely to experience poor quality housing you're more likely to experience barriers and discrimination in the workplace. Uh, and racism impacts people on a structural and on a personal level, you know, impacting key areas that shape outcomes in health, well-being and in wealth. Um, and I think that is really important to sort of outline because it's sort of the duty of all of us. It's the duty of all of us across multiple sectors to engage in actions to combat racism and to challenge inequalities and to prioritise inclusion. Um, so I was quite happy actually when going through the strategy to see that it references a desire and strategic aim to embed anti-racism, anti-ableist values into organisational cultures and programming. I think priority, prioritising that is really key and is a sort of key outcome and strategy uh, to do when engaging in anti-racist practice in particular, but also engaging in sort of wider practices to achieve that aim of inclusion. Um, and I think it's something that is quite often missed within the museum space, or perhaps has been missed until now, uh, the actual key role that museums can play as spaces. Um, and then Mike was just talking about fair work. I think it goes without saying, you know, museums are key employers and that focus on inclusion, that focus on anti-racism has a very, direct impact on people who work in museum spaces, but also just the wider narrative um, and the wider issues that museums can shape and be at the forefront of. Um, so museums are key sites of education, they're key sites of learning, uh, particularly in a country like Scotland that has a history of empire, a history of slavery, uh, and the legacies of which shape the racism of the present. Museums can be 
a key space to discuss those issues uh, and can be a key space to educate people on the full and the true history of Scotland. I know that's something that has begun to be being done. You know, there's ongoing work in Glasgow museums. Uh, there was the creating discomfort intervention at the Hunterian Museum in Glasgow uh, that began to explore some of the ways in which those legacies are present within the Hunterian's collection. Um, but I think that's why we're sort of in particular interested and excited to see where the uh, Empire, Empire Slavery in Scotland's museums work and project moves forward. So I think that will be really key for exploring how um, Scotland can begin to sort of tell the true narrative of its history through the museum sector. But I also welcome the fact that that work and that project will be taking place alongside a strategy like this one that focuses on inclusion and anti-racism, particularly from the perspective of organisational culture and programming, um, because as important as it is to have that museum that talks about the histories of empire, talks about the histories of slavery in Scotland, um, I don't think it would mean much if we're not doing work to address the legacies of that, and the legacy of that is you know, racism and inequality in the present day, um, because a lot of the way in which empire worked was to create these hierarchies in society, and a lot of them were based around racial hierarchies, but they also impacted and shaped hierarchies and created other forms of inequalities as well. Um, so I'll just conclude by saying that one other thought I had when reading through the strategy, and particularly how it talks about inclusion, is that a lot of the work um, and a lot of the change that it would create is work that I don't think we've seen in the museum sector until now. I think that's great. I think it's great that it's aspirational. I think it's great that it will encourage new ways of working. But I also think it's important to acknowledge within that that it will require you know, sort of brave approaches to inclusion, new approaches to in achieving inclusion. And that means that not, every, not necessarily everything that the strategy will encourage will work, but I think that's part of how we learn because a lot of the things that we're trying to fight against um, and a lot of the things that we're trying to achieve in terms of achieving inclusion, in terms of achieving anti-racism and embedding anti-racist values into organisations are things that haven't been done before. Um, and we're sort of fighting against things that have existed and shaped our society for centuries. Powerful words, Nelson. Thank you so much for that. And uh, I suppose it, we, we, there's a long way to go. We've made a start, and that, that's, what's, that's, that's hugely important. I'm just wondering if you could just say a little bit more about the, the kind of partnerships that, that, um, that we we're, we're aspiring to in, in the project. You say we're, we're, there's a quite a lot of outputs of working with a particular community or addressing a particular... How can we, can we turn that, those individual projects, into actually changing our organisations to be more inclusive organisations? Is that... Is this the right way to go about that? Yeah, I think so. I think the fact that it focuses on um, sort of embedding those values into organisational cultures and programming is really important. I think a lot of the time um, approaches to sort of community engagement and poachment to engagement with communities aren't represented in museum spaces is quite often focused on bringing groups in for like one project, one piece of work. Groups may not get an opportunity to engage with the wider workings of the museum and there might not be that much change actually uh, or impact across the museum so I think that focus on cultures is really important because to me that says you know an emphasis on engaging with senior management and all staff within the museum and going sort of all the way through and I think that um, yeah is really important for sort of changing that and making sure that um, the sort of engagement with groups that are quite often marginalised in museum spaces isn't just a sort of one-off thing and actually um, sort of takes hold and has a deeper lasting impact. Fantastic, thank you. Well, it's, it's going to take commitment, isn't it? And it's, going to take, and it's not going to be a quick fix, but it's something that MGS is really committed to and working with partners such as yourselves. We very much look forward to the, the coming years and what we can achieve together. So thank you for that. Um, should we, does any of the panel want to come in on anything that Nelson said or do we want to keep going through the presentations and we'll... We'll pass on to Diane to talk to us about place and we'll pick up your questions on all the subjects at the end. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's um, a real pleasure to be here today and um, to be discussing the importance of place-based approaches in Scotland's museums gallery sector. 
face working is a significant part of um, my professional interest as head of engagement with the National Tree Heritage Fund, but also as vice chair of SURF, which is Scotland's regeneration forum. Each of these organisations takes a place approach to their work. So the National Lottery Heritage Fund has been focusing on projects with outcomes that create better places to live in, work in and visit, and boosting local economies. We support all types of natural and cultural heritage, and our place-based approach encompasses all aspects of history and heritage. SURF is an independent network organisation exploring current practice, experience and knowledge, and seeks to influence the development of successful regeneration policy and practice. Of course, these are just two of the organisations that I'm involved with that prioritise and promote place-based approaches in Scotland. There's several other valuable organisations out there and which I know that the strategy will aim to connect you with. For those who might need to become a bit more familiar um, or just refresh, so one way I suppose we're talking about place-based approaches is about understanding the unique character of a context of a particular location of a place and using that knowledge to inform uh, and shape museum and galleries work. Many museums across Scotland already take this approach in one form or another, often without realising it and perhaps using those terms and that language around it. Whether it's through collaborating with local communities or displaying and preserving local collections, Scotland's museums and galleries are already playing a critical role in bringing heritage to life in their communities. And as we go through this priority area this morning, I wanted, first of all, just to ask everybody in the room and online, if you would think about a place that is special to you. So just take a moment. What does it look like? What does it sound like? What makes it special and unique? What stories and memories are associated with it? How has it changed over time? What do you want to preserve or protect about that place? What role, if any, do you see museums and heritage organisations playing in the future of this place? And most importantly, how does it make you feel? So we at the Heritage Fund have been really privileged to work with so many different museums and galleries across the country over the years. Because of limited time, I'm just going to mention a couple of examples. So taking a place-based approach, uh, Linlithgow Heritage Trust quite recently um, relocated Annette House Museum to a new space in the Partnership Centre in the heart of Linlithgow. It now features three new galleries and a bespoke community space, providing fresh interpretation of the town's history and showcasing the Trust's rich collection of objects, photographs and archives. However, most importantly, participation and engagement are at the heart of this community-centred museum, with volunteers from across the area developing heritage-based skills and local people having the opportunity to participate in activities like art workshops and community archaeology digs. This approach ensures that community ownership of the heritage of Nalithgo is there and is sustainable into the future and also, of course, is the town's only accredited museum. Another fantastic example of place-based approach is at Paisley Museum, Paisley Museum Reimagined Project. Since the project began, they've engaged with over 90 local people to shape story-led displays in their refurbished <coughs> museum. One of the museum's partners, Who Cares Scotland, which is a charity that gives voice to young people who are care experienced, has been helping to make the museum a more welcoming place and space where those young people want to spend time by sharing their experiences and insight with museum staff. The aim is for both the young people and the people that work and volunteer in the museum to learn from each other, to create a space that has a sense of belonging where people feel that it's their right to be there. This was summed up really well by one of the young people who said in one of the sessions, my passion for learning and teaching other generations and being part of my local community makes it more my home. This project takes a place approach by being inclusive of a wider audience, by ensuring that Paisley Museum will be a space for all. Much like the previous example, it will provide the communities in Paisley with the opportunity to own their heritage. It's their space, their place. 
Our museums and galleries and heritage spaces are doing good work to engage with others in understanding and providing meaning for places and communities. They enable people to understand why they feel so strongly about places, giving those feelings language and showing perhaps why those connections exist and how we've got to the places and spaces that we have today. That is a really considerable contribution to make in our communities when people are feeling excluded, isolated, vulnerable, all the challenges that we've heard about already this morning. People need to come together with different perspectives, different roles and responsibilities to address those needs and challenges. So thinking back to the question that I posed to you, think of a place that's special to you. I ask it because places and spaces are essential to who we are and how we create meaning for ourselves and for others, with others. The point is that anyone that's asked that question always thinks of a place that they have an emotional connection to. And taking a place-based approach provides a space that allows someone to feel, to be, and to reflect. So keep doing what you're doing. Embrace the strategy with its focus on place and place-based approaches. Get together, talk to each other about how you can celebrate your communities um, and where you are. And certainly we at the Heritage Fund, and I know SURF as well, um, are so delighted that this focus on place is in the strategy and is a crucial part of it. We'll give that direction, that focus, that leadership. Um, and we look forward very much to working with MGS, museums, galleries, heritage spaces across the country uh, to strengthen our communities and our places. Thank you so much, uh, Diana, there's so much I could pick up on that, but actually I want to, because I know the minister has other appointments and needs to get away quite promptly, so I don't want him to miss his old school friend <laughs> talking about climate. So if we can move straight to Katie and we'll put, ask, have a discussion afterwards. Okay, well, um, thank you very much for having me. It's great to be down from Orkney to be here in person. So I'm introducing the climate priority area, which sits within the resilience strand of the new strategy. Um, for those of you who don't know Stromness, we're a small independent museum run by a board of voluntary trustees and we're situated right on the sea's edge in a town of roughly 2,000 folk on the mainland of Orkney. And we all have a part to play in achieving the country's net zero ambitions wherever we are. MGS's survey showed that almost 80% of respondents from 271 museums already describe climate change and sustainability as important um, to their organisation and energy usage was ranked up at the top of what they're currently undertaking. Now this can be tricky in um, Victorian museum buildings like ours but we are working towards tripling our loft insulation which is going to have big savings to our um, energy usage and bills and we're also aspiring to a new museum extension which will hopefully allow us to have a sea source heat pump. So getting energy um, from the sea, just like so much of Stromness's heritage. But being part of our local community means that we also can source purchases locally because um, we need our town to prosper in order for our museum to thrive. And this has a knock on effect on decarbonisation. But for us at Stromness Museum, climate action is more than LED light bulbs or insulation. The Board of Trustees alongside the museum staff have decided that in order to remain relevant and, resili and resilient, <coughs> we have to take on a new role in our community. So we are striving to become an anchor organisation for climate change. We think that museums have a unique role to play in communicating the cri climate crisis to the public. And this is starting to embed itself in the work we do. Schools are starting to come to us when they are studying climate change. We've been running workshops on the Arctic environment and how they're being affected by climate change. And this topic dovetails perfectly with children studying Dr. John Ray, Orkney's great Arctic explorer in a way that teachers hadn't imagined before. We've been using our collection in new ways to inspire the next generation of Arcadians to care for and record their natural environment. 
For instance, we teamed up with a local environmental consultancy and other marine scientists to offer rocky shore surveys to the local primary school inspired by our seaweed collection. We simply couldn't do what we do without our range of partnerships. We work with Marine Recording Citizen Science Project Sea Search to ensure that the data collected from our snorkel safaris makes its way to national databases. And our current winter exhibition on how fossils can communicate the six mass extinctions has relied heavily on expert help from out with our organisation. We work with academic institutions such as the University of the Highlands and Islands, where two of my colleagues have been speaking to a museum curator on the island of Niue in the Pacific. Now, the Heritage Centre in Niue was destroyed um, and 90% of their collection wiped out in Cyclone Heta in 2004. This new partnership is helping us to bring climate justice to the forefront because small island states in the Pacific, where some of our ethnographic collection originates from, are facing increased risk from extreme weather events, having caused just a tiny percentage of greenhouse gas emissions themselves. So from a global perspective back to a local, since uh, COP26, um, we've been holding climate cafes with funding from Museums Gallery Scotland, and 72% of our participants thought that rural communities think differently about climate change. The Young Farmers was one of the groups we worked with, and during the cafe, they demonstrated their profound and intrinsic connection that they have with Orkney's land and environment. And I think this ties in perfectly with having a place-based approach and knowing your local community and being part of it. And finally, in order to protect our planet, we need to feel connected to it. And museums, not only those with natural history collections, have a unique role to play in fostering these connections. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. And I think what that really brings home to me is, uh, well, it's the richness that we have in, in our sector, but, but even, a, a, I don't, don't mind you calling call it a small museum, like yes, the Stromness yes. Museum, the number of connections that a, that a museum like yours has, the number of partnerships and indeed international partnerships that you have, working across, I think you mentioned all of the strands of the, of the strategy across that. So it gives me so much heart for how we can take the strategy forward, given, you know, the, what you're showing, you're demonstrating what can be achieved um, and, and it doesn't necessarily need, need scale of resource. It's, it's the ideas and the ways of working. Of course, scale of resource is great, Minister. <laughs> it, all, it all helps, but actually what, what can be achieved by, by working in, in, in the right ways and with the imagination and creativity that you're showing. So thank you for that. Um, so, uh, oh, right. So we're going to move on to the, the questions that we've got now. Um, and actually, I was going to pick up on, uh, on a question that I was, I was going to ask um, Diane before. Thank Minister, you. thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, so, um, and then we'll come to the questions there. But I was going to ask you about, that. You, you work with a lot of, there's a lot of big place-based initiatives going on. Mm. You've talked about how museums are all doing place, and yet sometimes not all engaged in some of those other wider initiatives that are happening. Have you got any advice to museums uh, and galleries to how they can get better engaged with wider place initiatives? Uh, I think, I mean, as uh, I'm sure a lot of people would expect, but I think that um, partnership collaboration aspect is absolutely key. Mm -hmm. Katie was talking about it, um, and yeah, totally amazing, obviously, the work that you're doing in Stromness and the number of connections mm -hmm within the community, across the community. Um, I guess to, to reach out and um, uh, I think museums and galleries need to have a really strong role within their places and the work that is happening, you know, whether it's going to be communities developing local place plans, of course there's been a number of charrettes and other types of planning activities happening across communities. Um, I'm sure many museums and galleries are absolutely linked into that. I guess, you know, for us in the culture sector, it's always kind of, yeah, and <laughs> what about us? What about, what about our place in our space? For me, a really critical part in that is um, the role that museums and galleries, I think, can play in broadening the conversation uh, around what is going to happen in our places and the change that's going to happen, which is inevitable. So um, 
some of the things I was talking about, you know, understanding, better understanding how people feel about their place. Very often when you talk about change that's going to happen in a place and there may be some negative things will come forward. Change can be tricky, it can be difficult, create tension, sometimes conflict. It can, it can be really challenging. But underlying that is very likely to be a really positive care and concern for that place. Perhaps a feeling that um, there's a risk to the, the security and um, comfort that people have in their places. And they're a bit concerned that that's at risk. So it's the work that museums and galleries do so well is, is holding that space and those conversations. And to me, if we can bring more to the fore those, those voices about how people feel about their places and bring that to bear in some of the decisions that are taken, I think that could be really powerful. Thank you, very interesting. Um, so we've got questions coming in. Now there, there's a, a range of different questions. Um, some of them are, are sort of directed for the panel. Some of them are more MGS questions, which we'll take later, because I want to make use of, of the panel that we have here. There's a question here, um, which is how can we collectively ensure greater diversity in key roles in a sector that historically has not been a viable career choice for many in BM, BAME communities? So I suppose, I don't know if we want to, but Mike and Nelson, I imagine you both have something to, to say about this, about the diversity of, of the workforce and how do we, how do we um, what do we need to do together to try and bring people, a greater diversity of people into the sector? What, do you want to go first? Or? You can go first. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, I think there is one thing that always um, stands out to me is that a lot of museum spaces don't actually tell sort of histories and stories that um, particularly, I think, resonate with minority ethnic people. I think particularly minority ethnic people, um, you know, who've lived in Scotland for a long time, were born in Scotland, quite often don't see sort of their experiences of Scotland uh, represented in museum spaces. And I think that in itself is very alienating um, and, you know, makes it quite an alienating space for people from that background to want to go and work in the sector. Um, but I also just think there's sort of much like wider outreach work, um, you know, work around sort of things like internships, um, on the apprenticeships that needs to happen as well. Um, and I think part of it is actually acknowledging the scale of the problem, the depth of the problem, um, to then get in a position to sort of take actions to address it. Um, because I know it's something that has sort of come up more and more and more of a recognition of the sort of lack of diversity in the sector, but I think there needs to be more work done to highlight how deep the problem is to then figure out the actions that we need to take to address it. Thank you, and I think um, we, we talked about the importance for a diverse audience. This isn't a quick fix, is it? Because actually, Mike, you talked about people coming to the current and seeing people that look like them that feel like, and, and so the, the starting with the workforce and diversifying the workforce seems to me to be key to that, that change of, of if you want to have a more diverse audience, is that? Yeah, I, I, and again, it sounds simple. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and, it's, and I think, uh, just picking on what you were saying there about quite often we do a lot of projects or we do a bit of work with, 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 with people. It's about locking it in, into the governance. You know, I've got, uh, I'm, um, you know, t chair of trustees and, Deputy Chair sat at the back there, if you want to have a word of them later. And, and, and Fiona, who's there, is actually leading from a trustee's point of view around our fair work and our diversity of the workforce. So it's not a, a project at the side or something that we're thinking about. It's embedded in the governance mm -hmm. and, it, and, it, and it flows right through, you know, and it comes along to, to, to meet, you know, the partners and everything else to ensure that it's locked back into the board as, as, well, as well as, you know, the, the ambitions of, 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 of the staff. It's locked in right across the workforce and the workforce does include, of course, of course it does your trustees um, and, and them having that approach as well and that leadership there to, to, keep, to keep characters like me on my toes and ask me the hard questions to ensure that that's those spaces. And the other reality is not every 16, 17, 18 year old person in Aberfeldy, which is the nearest town to us, is gagging to work in a museum. <laughs> <laughs> they, they are not waking up each morning thinking, by gum, I'd love to be working with that collection. <laughs> Because they aren't, they couldn't give two monkeys. <laughs> so, so we've had to go in there and, and, and do an awful... So when we launched the apprenticeship programme, we didn't get a single applicant. Why should we? Because, you know, we advertise that, they, that those folks aren't going to be on the MGS website looking to see where the jobs are. 
So, we, so obviously, you, go, you start from the other end. We went into school. We worked with the social services, developing the young workforce people, the young, young person guarantee folks. And we created a, a, a support network. You can't just bring these folks in either. We have to get the culture right. Uh, we've done all that. So I think it's, it's, it's a big picture thing. And that's why I look it back to the governance as well. Um, it's not just a simple, we'll just have one of those in the team. It's, it's, it's an overarching philosophy, which I hope came across earlier on. I don't know if that makes any sense. It makes perfect sense. Okay. Yeah, it absolutely does. <laughs> Luckily. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank you both. Um, talking of trustees, we've got an excellent question here from one of, one of our trustees, Matthew. Thank you. Um, which really, across the panel, we, we've talked a bit about this project base, but actually the, the, that balance between funding is often project based, but, but a lot of the work is, is not that. So what work is the panel proud of that is overlooked because it is not project based? And how can we be better at sharing our excellent embedded practice? There's a teaser. Does anyone want to come in on that? Well, I was, when, when you mentioned that, it makes me think of um, all the work that, that's done in collections, you know, just physical caring for collections, um, sorting out backlogs, clearing, you know, clearing spaces, re, you know, redoing spaces, all, you know, all the work that goes on behind the scenes and also the research that goes into, you know, objects and finding out provenance and um, all, all that work doesn't normally get the sort of big wow stories, but it all has to go on in order for all the other work to go on. Uh, it's it's so. a really important point, isn't it, Katie, that, that because it, it it, it does. It, it's not the newest thing. It's it's the yeah. and it gets sort of thought of as the bread and butter work, which it, it kind of. But actually, it's the fundamental source of everything, mm -hmm. and that's why we put it in the middle of the strategy. Because actually, yeah. to give it its own, it's actually it, it's the root of everything. It's the purpose of, of, you know, yeah. of why museums exist. So it's it's there in the centre, is relating and and the, the work that you do in relation to climate is based on your collections. So it's yeah. the collection that enables you to tell those stories. Isn't yeah, it? and and gaining greater knowledge of that collection and making the connections with people who know about it so and yeah. it's also critical to us being able to tell more diverse stories um, yeah. and that all has to come from from the collection and the truths about that as well thank you for mm -hmm. that any other thoughts on work that is overlooked Diane um yeah I, one thing I'm really proud of that we've done in our the small team that we are in, in Scotland for the fund um mm. it was well, there was an initiation that we, uh, we every year we have a, a theme and a focus um, for our, that we work with our committee and staff team on. And um, we take time aside. And back in 2019, we decided that the focus was going to be on um, working with ethnic minority communities. We didn't even call it racism or anti-racism then. We said, yeah, that, that's an important focus. Um, what are we doing? And then um, the murder of George Floyd happened in May 2020. And we realized we needed to totally change or shift or um, accelerate uh, what we were doing and how we were looking at the work that we're doing and how we're engaging. Um, and so we embarked as a staff team and committee jointly um, on a program which we undertook just across our team. There's nothing public about it, uh, particularly. Um, we embarked on a series of conversations. Um, we involved a facilitator who's a, an expert um, on inclusion and diversity. And we heard from um, a range of different contributors and speakers across the sector and out with the sector. And I think we really went on a journey um, as a group of individuals and as a staff team, and as I say, with our committee members as well which was, um, I think, hugely powerful in um, the work that we do now and, and the place that we've been able to get to. And we know that there's a huge amount more that we need to do, but um, it really, I would say, it was one of the most meaningful things I've ever done in my career. Um, and I look forward to doing a whole lot more, but yeah. Thanks, Sam. That's great. We, we talk a lot in MGS about it's not just it's not just the what, it's the how, yeah. and each project that you do should be embedding learning and actually changing how we are as organisations. So that, that, that's powerful in terms of, of, of how we sustain that and, and draw that out. That we don't just rush from project to project. And I know it's a challenge for, for everybody, and it's it's 
but the funding models don't help that, but I'm trying to build in that space to, to keep learning and developing. Uh, we're nearly out of time, but Mike Lelson, did you have, did you have a burning thing you wanted to share? Yeah, I think just that, just that as the others have said, that day-to-day -day challenges that we work as a team and, and the conversations that we have, to, have developed the practice and developed our, our openness. And I suppose on the, on the project front, it's what happens when the project ends and that funding ends and that friendship is still there and that, and that collectiveness is still there and we're still working with and building on that work, even though the, the, the money is gone, uh, the love is still there and, we, and, we, and it's not picking up a group and then dropping them and picking up another group. It's just developing a, a, a broader Cranog community of which we were all part and all play our parts in. Nelson, do you have a, f a final word on this question? Um, no, I think <laughs> good man. Yeah. And there's, there's so many more questions that are coming in. So thank you for those. We will answer some of those online that are sort of practical uh, M MGSE things, or um, we'll pick up some qu more questions as well at the end when we've got uh, got a, a further Q and A session. But I want to thank all of our expert panel members for their contributions and what they've shared with us today. First of all. So we now have a refreshment break. Um, we'd like to, uh, we'll rejoin after, after the break to talk a bit more about the practicalities. We're gonna talk about the changes to our grant outcomes and how we use our funding to, to support the work of delivering the strategy. We're gonna have a bit of a showcase of our, our new website and the resources that are being launched today. But thank you all for, for the, joining us for this session, first of all. Uh, please do have a refreshment to be back here for 11.15. everyone welcome I don't think I need to ask whether you've enjoyed your break uh, um, we, we are running about 15 minutes behind apologies to those joining us online who uh, didn't have so much conversation and chat over the break but uh, a very lively uh, discussion uh, that, that took place there so we'll cut into our time for questions at the end but we'll, we'll, we'll get through you know I think it's really important that we, we have this opportunity to talk about the strategy but it's great just seeing as, as the minister and indeed Ray said about having everyone in the room and the opportunity to connect is such a, an important part of today as well. So I'm, I'm delighted that to see so many great conversations happening. So welcome back to this session. We're going to be going into further detail on how we're going to deliver the strategy. So the first part of the morning hopefully provided you with a flavour of the concepts, the themes and ideas behind the ambition and vision for the strategy. And this next part of the morning is to provide some more practical information and guidance. As we said, this is a strategy by the sector for the sector, and it's been developed in collaboration with you, and MGS will continue to work with the sector and our partners to facilitate and deliver it. Thank you to those who've already indicated interest in collaborating with us on the delivery of the strategy. We will, over the coming months, be providing further detail on how we'll take this forward together, and we're keen to hear from any other organisations who want to be involved. So the strategy itself is predominantly an online publication and can be accessed via our Strategy Hub page on the new website, which has gone live this morning. Um, more on that coming very soon. And on the website, you'll also find films, case studies, and other guidance on how the strategy will be delivered by MGS and by the museums and galleries sector. Being online, it means it remains a live document where we can share progress against the strategy, respond to evolving needs and opportunities, it's also an opportunity to showcase the great work that you are all doing to deliver the strategy, so please do keep sharing your work with us. We were determined to create a practical strategy that remains useful throughout its lifetime, and that led us to this online approach. This is a bit of a live experiment, and we will keep reviewing how that's working and look forward to hearing your feedback. We have also printed a limited number of uh, uh, excerpts of the strategy as an aid memoir, which set out the actions for the sector. Copies have been mailed to every museum and should be arriving around today. Uh, but please take a copy as you wish to today. Now, I just want to touch on another major piece of work that has informed the strategy, which has been the National Survey of Scotland's Museums and Galleries. So conducted by DC Research, this huge piece of work, the first of its kind in over 20 years, has given us invaluable information, not simply about the size and shape of the sector, about our workforce, but also about funding models, skills gaps, and the sector's current and immediate priorities and needs in different areas related to the strategy. This data provides us with a powerful baseline from which we can measure progress against the strategy. And I want to thank all of you who took the considerable time to respond to that research. One of those surveys you lands 
the, as a brick in your inbox. But thank you for the time. It's so important that we have this data. And we look sure we'll be sharing that report in the next fortnight on our website, and we'll be delving into it much more detail in the weeks and months to come to inform our strategy delivery and our advocacy work. And we hope that data will be valuable to others in their work as well. So without further delay, I'd now like to welcome Gillian Simerson to the stage, uh, to the rostrum, indeed, she's on the stage, <laughs> to speak about how our grant outcomes will change to support the delivery of the strategy. And I also just want to take this moment to tell you that Jill is newly promoted to the role of Head of Museum Development, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Jill to the executive team, where we know her 10 years of experience and expertise within MGS will bring deep knowledge to the sector and to this important role. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy, and um, good morning, everybody. The um, first thing to say is it was great to hear this morning of the announcement of the um, extra £500,000 of capital funding from the government, for which we're very grateful. Um, to clarify, that money does need to be spent within this financial year, spent, allocated within this financial year. It's very good timing because we're currently assessing um, the second round of our resilience fund, which has been very heavily oversubscribed. So that um, funding will allow us to... Uh, fund far more of those projects that we're currently looking at. Um, but I'm here mainly to introduce our new grant outcomes. Um, so our grants are a key tool for us in how we um, support uh, museums to deliver against the, the strategy and to develop. So we set out our grant outcomes to um, uh, put forward what we want our funding to help museums to achieve. And we ask you, um, museums applying to the funds, to lay out in their applications how, they, how their project is going to deliver those outcomes. So we have six, which I think you can see on the screen. Um, and these are very much aligned to the three strands of the strategy and the ten priorities that sit underneath them. And hopefully you can clearly see how that is. So our first two, um, funded organisations will be more resilient as a result of our funding and funded organisations will be more environmentally sustainably, sustainable, obviously links very much to that resilient strand. The third one, collections will be better cared for and managed and more accessible, connects to the collections that sit at the heart of what we do and indeed the heart of that knot. Um, outcome number four, the museum workforce will be more, more skilled, confident and diverse. So obviously sitting under the um, workforce strand and then under the connection strand, our final two outcomes, um, a wider range of people will be engaging with and represented in museums. Museums will enhance quality of life for people uh, by improving well-being, supporting learning and contributing to placemaking. That's quite a long one. So those of you who are familiar with applying to MGS grants um, will maybe remember that we have previously had 14 grant outcomes, so we have reduced the number considerably. And that was really to, to simplify things and uh, to, to just get across the clear things that we want to support you to do um, and hopefully help you to come up with more um, focused projects. Um, but even though we've reduced it down to six, we're not looking for projects that meet all six of these aims. That's not what we're expecting. We just want to see um, well-developed projects that will deliver and make a demonstrable difference against some of these outcomes. If we could have the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so alongside these grant outcomes, we've got something a little bit new. Um, we're setting out five things that we expect of organisations that we fund, um, principles that we expect them to be committed to. And I'll just go through them. So the first one is fair work. And hopefully you can see again how they tie up with what we've been talking about this morning in the strategy. The second one is taking action to meet net zero targets and tackle the biodiversity crisis. Thirdly, becoming more inclusive. Fourthly, we want museums who are applying to us to be sustain in invested in sustainable strategic development and we want them to be working collaboratively wherever possible. So these apply regardless of the activity that you're asking, to, uh, that you're asking us to fund. Um, we want the organisations that we support to be um, being shaped by these commitments and, and for their projects to sort of evolve out of them. Um, but I want to be um, very clear that this is about demonstrating a commitment to these things. It is not the case that you have to be leading the sector in all five areas to access MGS funding. This is about just telling us that, and showing us how you're actively addressing these things in your specific circumstances and at your stage of development. So there will be questions at relevant places throughout the application form that help you to tell us a bit more about that. But as is always the case, 
speak to the grants team um, if you've got any questions about how you would um, demonstrate these things in an application. So that concludes my run through of the outcomes and um, expectations commitments. Um, I know that what people really want to hear about is the 23-24 grants programme. Um, this um, good news is we're announcing this today and um, it will be familiar. The Museum Development Fund is coming back and as is the Small Grants Fund and we'll have two rounds of the former, three of the latter. Um, the forms will be a little bit different because obviously we've um, updated them to help you to, to demonstrate um, which outcomes you're going to meet and, um, and how you meet these commitments. Um, so yeah, that's really all I have to say, but the dates um, are all available on our new website, which is, makes it time to hand over to Kelly. <laughs> Thank you. Just, just to say, um, Kelly and the comms team at MGS have been absolutely instrumental in helping to create a new website with the fresh content and resources that we're about to see. We thought it was a brilliant idea to launch a new strategy on the same day as launching a new website, <laughs> on the same day as launching new programmes and the results of a major national survey. And I'm pretty sure we've pulled it off, so we're, we have an exhausted but, but, but happy team. So, Kelly, the website. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Um, after so many exciting announcements today, I get to finally have my Steve Jobs moment of like standing up at the end of an, an Apple product launch and saying, but there's one more thing. Um, and that's really to launch uh, the new website that um, I give you full permission. If you have your device, if you have your phone, if you're at, at home and you're watching along, just open the tab for museumsgallerysscotland.org.uk and just start scrolling through it whilst I'm talking. Because I'm not really the exciting thing. The exciting thing is like, is online. I want to firstly start by saying that when we decided to kick this project off way back in 2021, um, planning for this day, in fact, all the way back then, that what we really wanted to focus on was both a values-led and a human-centered design approach to the website. The old website, it, it kind of, it got built as it went and it didn't really have that anymore and we were feeling the frustrations from the sector about not really being able to find what you needed or, um, you know, make it work in the way that worked for you. And we've responded to that by uh, ensuring that we had a stakeholder group from the sector throughout the build and design process of the site. And I want to say thank you to everyone that was involved in that for just making the site something that could be enjoyed by everyone in the sector. You may see behind me now, actually, that one of the things that was most asked for was a need for connection in the sector, um, that people needed to be able to reach out to each other in easier ways. And so we now have a lovely map. Um, so we have, everyone loves a map, especially in the museum sector. So we have a lovely map up there, um, which will list all of the museums in Scotland, along with really important data points, um, mm -hmm. things like whether someone's accredited, whether they're a recognized collection, uh, we'll also be putting more information up there about things like projects that they might have been involved in or um, training that they might be involved in, things like the business support programme. Um, and that's really to let you see what's going on around you, um, to know what's happening at the museum down the road and to have contact details so you can reach out to them and say, hey, I really want to hear more about what you're doing. I've seen this great case study that's on your profile. Can you talk to me more about it? And that was really at the heart of what we wanted to do with the site, was to connect people better and to ensure that things like the strategy remain embedded within that as well, in that connection strand. Um, I just want to say finally that whilst you're poking about on the site, it's a soft launch today, obviously. <laughs> We've been going like the clappers to get everything ready for you. And we'll be continuing to tweak and test and to add more things as things go along in the next couple of months. Um, so if you do see anything that you think could be improved, absolutely, I want to hear it. Um, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Brilliant. So thank you, Kelly, and to Jill. Um, there's an awful lot to digest in there. Um, but we're going to open the floor to questions as before. And uh, we've got Slido running again to collate those. So if you want to start putting um, your questions in, we'll answer them as they come through. I want to welcome also to the stage for this final session, Enya Nikonila, our Head of Communications. Enya's been absolutely instrumental in leading on this strategy work. 
The early consultation phase was led by our colleague Joe Trainer, who I know has joined us online today. Hello, Joe. Uh, and Enya has been led on turning all of that sector input from all that consultation into what we are sharing with you today. So Enya, do you want to join us to take the difficult questions? <laughs> Thank you. Right, so we have um, our most voted for question, Enya, I'm going to come to you first, um, from David Mann, who so they're great to have the minister and to hear his support for the sector, but do MGS meet with other ministers, such as those at Education and Fair Work? Thanks, David. Um, yes, we do. I mean, certainly the Minister Gray is, um, he's got a commitment to support culture and, and he would be our primary contact, but absolutely we engage across all um, ministerial um, sections across the government as well too and work closely as well with the cultural committee ensuring that they're up to speed in terms of how the sector is and fairing. I think a great thing about this strategy is that now that we have this and this work set ahead for us in the sector as well too, part of our work just now is looking at the business plan and how MGS supports the sector and really making sure that our advocacy voice is strong and targeted as well too on behalf of the sector. So please always get in touch, let us know the good stories that you have and what we can share because these are things that we can share with the relevant parts of the, of the government as well too. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Enya. Um, so I'm just sorry, looking at, at, at questions in here. Uh, there's a question here from, from Sharon, uh, Sharon Heal. Um, thank you, Sharon. How do we ensure that anti-racism and decolonisation um, are embedded and not just temporary interventions? I mean, obviously, that's a, that's a question, um, not just for MGS, it's a question for us all as a whole sector. Uh, and I think um, it is that collective responsibility to do that that comes across in, in, the, in, the, across in the strategy, in the consultation, and I think we're seeing a lot of, of sort of commitment to doing that. Um, MGS are currently developing a project that we hope to bring forward um, later this year, which looks to, to um, a project called Delivering Change, which um, we're hoping we will be able to roll out, as I say, later in the year and, and run for a number of years, that is looking really at that embedding. And we've heard from the panel earlier that, about the importance uh, that, that projects need to lead to, to organisational change. Um, and at MGS, uh, we're really keen that we, we think about what that means for us first. Uh, we absolutely have to look at our own organisation and how we work and then we can share what our experience has been and we hope that you will share what your experience has been and then we, it, it's a collective learning process because I think what we've heard about is the, um, uh, that this is long-term change that we're needing here and so short-term projects need to cumulatively pick away at that. Because of the way the sector is funded, short-term projects are always going to be a reality for us but they all have to keep contributing and building. And, and we hope by having things like this website, which is a platform for sharing not just our work, but for sharing your work, uh, we, can, we see that as a key part of our role to facilitate that, that joint learning and, and learning from each other. And, and MGS has to listen as well as, as, as talk. Uh, so I think that's a really important part for us. Sharon, I don't know if that answers your question. But <laughs> Got a thumbs up, we'll go with that. Okay, other questions. Of course, I'm the only one who can see these, apart from the, <laughs> from the panel. I'm looking if there's any questions for... Um, uh, questions for other members of the panel. Got an interesting question here from, um, from Robert Trimontium. Can any of the panel tie in their strand with the work? So this was the panel from before, so I'm going to ask this panel to, to, how their work... Um, it's just moved on the screen. Where's that gone? It's just disappeared from my screen, but I think, <laughs> I don't know quite why. The question was about tying in volunteering. Yeah, tying in volunteering to the, because obviously we all, we all rely on volunteers immensely for our work, small and large, and how those strands can be tied with that kind of um, relationship we have with volunteers. So just for those who, who are joining us online might not have heard that, how do we turn in these strands of work and the parts of the strategy across volunteers? That's one of the things the survey tells us. More than half of our workforce our, our volunteers, so that's really critical um, that, that we, we do that. So we, we can think about that in terms of, of grants and indeed the digital capacity and, and other work. So Jill, do you want to just talk about how we, if there's a grant making answer to that? <laughs> okay. Or indeed a head of museum development? Um, I think um, when we talk about workforce, we are talking about um, everybody in the workforce because we're so aware that it involves, um, so much of the workforce is volunteer. And so, um, when we're talking about diversity, that's, that's got to be amongst our volunteers as well. And we know the sector raised particular issues around that. I can hear something funny, I hope I sound okay. Um, 
raised issues around the, the struggle sometimes to diversify the, the volunteer workforce in particular, um, attracting um, uh, younger people into that. Um, so we do have programmes that are around specifically that, trying to um, engage younger people um, in the workforce. I'm struggling a little bit on the, the, the grants in particular, but I think what we're, we're looking for in the grants is that um, volunteers are treated fairly as well, um, and that where it's appropriate, um, obviously a volunteer doesn't get paid, but where it's appropriate, they, they do get suitable remuneration for, for, for their contributions and so on. So um, we absolutely look when we're assessing grants um, as to the status of who is being involved, whether they're paid staff or, or volunteers, and, and, and how they're being engaged along those fair work principles. Thanks, Jill. Kelly, you've got a role see, with the website, but also in supporting the sector with its digital capacity. Do you want to reflect a little bit on how, how important volunteers and their skills are to that, that uh, digital element of our work? Yeah, I would say that the, the last couple of years have really opened up our eyes to the capabilities of digital volunteering within the sector. It's something that's been reflected a lot in places like um, Make Your Mark, um, which is a website that actually hosts quite a lot of these opportunities for people to volunteer digitally. Um, even down to things like people who take time to edit Wikipedia about our heritage are all making really valuable contributions to, um, in a volunteering capacity um, to the work that we do. And I, I think helping people to connect with us and con connect with those volunteering opportunities online is a really great chance for museums in order to, to bring in new generations of volunteers who, who you know, might feel like they can't actually make a connection with a museum because, you know, young people are attached to their phones. But there's lots of skills there that we can be taking advantage of um, and can, can help us, like, pick up new tasks and um, see things from new perspectives as well and help us to remain relevant. Thanks, Kelly. And you, do you want to add anything or should we? Kelly's put it there. I put it there. <laughs> of course, of course. Um, there were two questions. So I just think about practical questions we might be able to address. Um, Two questions about accreditation mentors and the, the difficulty in finding accreditation mentors. I know, so just throwing that at you, Jill, because, because you haven't seen the questions in advance. But uh, do we have anything? Does anyone do we have anything we can share with that or work we're doing to try and increase that? I know that the expertise isn't necessarily. This may be a question we can come back to you and answer uh, answer online. But it's maybe a, a good place to highlight that lack of accreditation mentors, um, because there will be a lot of people listening who could maybe fulfil that role and aren't at the moment. So. Absolutely. So um, we, will, we will talk more about that online. It's obviously an, an interest, um, so we, we can talk about that. Um, so, so I'm looking for questions that have got lots of votes. I know there was a question earlier um, about uh, to ask me or the minister to, to respond and write what happens next in relation to the Empire Slavery in Scotland's Museums project. And I didn't want to sort of, I'm not, not avoiding the question because it's a really, really important question. It's just that we're still waiting. As the minister said, I think we're quite close now to a ministerial response to the recommendations. Uh, we have had, um, the, the minister has met with MGS, but met also with members of the steering group, which was a really positive meeting to really understand how those recommendations could be taken forward. Not surprisingly, there was, there was uh, conversations about the restrictions on the budget that there are at the moment in terms of the scale of, of the speed at which the ambitions can be realised. But there is something in the level four budget, in the budget, a uh, small amount to, to take those next steps forward. So um, we, we will, as soon as we have anything to share, we will obviously be able to share that. And, and it's really important that that, that, that that meeting with the minister and the steering group was, was really useful. So uh, we will share with you when, when we hear uh, anything more about that. So it was, but it was a very positive meeting. Um, question interesting one about how we work with partners to access different different ministers and your, your advocacy is obviously a key part of your, your team's work yeah. so how does our work with partners enable those different sort of cross portfolio conversations do you see a bit of yeah, major opportunity there yeah I mean the work that uh, the MGS stakeholder group did before I think we started to really reach out and understand what the issues were. And I think that's something that we're very keen to build on is just that understanding of what are the issues, where can MGS use our voice, where should others, where can we support others using our research or skills or the um, expertise within to really support others to be able to make that case. And I think as an organization, that's something that I hope everybody knows, please get in touch. We're accessible in that way, but also, I think strengthening that voice and using the information that we have, we have this big survey, the, the National Survey result, results that we are going to be able to mine. There's so much valuable information there that we're going to be able to mine 
and then look at where that crossover is with the work of partners as well too, and then to see one, who we should be working with, and that's been a key part of these later stages of, of developing the strategy is look, who's got the expertise in these areas, who should we make sure that we're having conversations with, that we're not duplicating effort, and then there's a voice there. These organisations then are able to champion the work of the sector too, so that's something as a national development body that's our role to make these these um, um, facilitate these engagements and connections. So, so absolutely, more of that to come. Great. Thank, thanks, Anya. Um, there's a bit of a theme of, of questions um, about, uh, well, related questions, I suppose, about this being a low earning sector and about how, therefore, realistically, we can diversify the workforce of whether it's an attractive um, sector to, to work in. Uh, again, what, what can MGS do about that? Uh, and, and what is our responsibility as a sector to do that? Because if we want to diversify the sector, we do obviously need to be attractive places to work. And it, it's not always about money. It's also about being fair and attractive and uh, uh, places to work where people are, feel invested in, feel valued and feel able to contribute. And, and Mike speaks very eloquently about that. Um, one of those things about the commitment to fair work that we're, we, we need to see that one of the things MGS can do is, is through, through our grant making. So... Uh, all, for, for a while now, we've had a, a, a requirement that any roles that we fund are paying um, the real living wage. Uh, the, the incoming requirement will be that we expect all individuals in those organisations we fund to be paying real living wage. And that, that's, not, that's, a, that's something that the Scottish Government is setting out a, a, across all of, it, all, all of its bodies in terms of, of, terms of funding. So I think um, there's work others by others, such as the Museums Association, have done their brilliant piece of work on salary benchmarking. That's really valuable just to sort of set those expectations and it encourages the conversations that we can have. But it's a responsibility for everybody. And, and, and MGS, you know, we don't run any museums. So, so those are the levers that we have and we will use them uh, and promote that. But it's a, it's a real issue for us if we want to, to bring people into the sector that they can see that, that is a, that's a, a, an attractive option. Yeah. Enya. I mean, just to add to this, and it also in terms of the, volu uh, the volunteering question earlier, part of the workforce strand, it really is all about ensuring that those opportunities for skills development are open and accessible to all. And we're going to be working very hard to ensure that all working within your organisations, volunteers, and also interacting interns and have access to these skills as well too. So that for us is something in terms of making sure that those opportunities are developed are there and open and visible. So please do help us share the word in terms of the information that we share with your organisations. If you're the primary contact, make sure that the, the details are filtering down in terms of who can see the opportunities that are available and, and help spread the word too. Great, thank you. Um, I think I'm going to take one more question, and I've just lost it again. Oh, no, it's a question from Gilly Burns, National Museums Scotland. Um, and Gilly asks about working with regional museum forums. And I think this is a really interesting, in, really interesting one about how... Uh, so most of Scotland now has a regional museums forum. Not everywhere does, and we're really interested in trying to fill any of the gaps. But these are, these are forums that are led by groups of museums, and MGS can support those forums. Um, and they've been incredibly valuable to those peer networks. And they're all different, and some of them, I mean, you, you, many of you will, will know um, probably better than me, but you know, some of them are heritage-wide forums, some of them are just museums, so they're very different depending on, on different parts of the country. Um, but there's a real interest in being able to um, support those forums in, in, in new ways of using them as ways of uh, delivering regional training and things like that. We're really keen to explore how best we can do that. And this is the question there from National Museum Scotland. How, they, how can they engage with that as well? So I think that that's a conversation that we can have with partners around that. Um, many of you may be aware also that the um, Historic Environment Scotland are currently consulting on our place in time. Uh, the Historic Environment um, Strategy, which is also under review, uh, 20th of February, I think, is the closing date for responses to that. But that it, they are also looking at um, what is the opportunity of regional forums and is there an opportunity for regional forums to be heritage-wide rather than just museums? Or is that... And, and it, so I think that's something that they're exploring through their strategy as well as to how to make the best connection there because in terms of place-based working, um, it's not always about museums that are the same size, you're the same type as you that you might be talking about similar things, but actually what else is going on in your area and, it, and, and if it's not just the museums in your area but the other things going on as well, then I think the forums can play a role in some of that and there's some brilliant work that's gone on. So um, I think, Gilly, in terms of the question about how, how can NMS be engaged, I think that's one for us to take up collectively with, with the with the forums and, um, and I know there's, we've got um, some more partnership working with NMS we're delighted about um, in relation to some of the work of taking forward this strategy so I'm sure that's one of the conversations that we we can take on. Um, I think we are pretty much out of time and there are quite a number of other questions here um, and I think we'll maybe just pick them up out, outside might be the best thing to do. We've got a question around multi-year funding posts 
learning from failure, well, that's an interesting question uh, as well. And there's a question around uh, what, uh, inclusion and um, how issues of, of accession, deaccession are entwined with that, that I think is too big to take on in the next two minutes. Uh, but it's absolutely <laughs> a debate that we need, to, we need to be having and we will be having. Um, so thank you all for your questions. If I say, please do keep the questions coming as well. I mean, we, we're, we're out of time pretty much just now. So I really just want to, to close um, by saying we've shared a lot of information with you today and there's lots more to read, to digest as you explore the strategy and the website. You may all be busy doing that on your phones right now. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be lots more questions to come and we will definitely be launching a series of, of further discussions around those areas of the, of the strategy as we roll it out. So please do get in touch with us if you want to pick up on any of the things you've heard from today. I want to thank again everyone who contributed to the creation of the strategy right from across the sector and from all our partner organisations. I want to thank Diffley Partnership for supporting the consultation and the strategy development. I also want to thank those who've travelled far and wide to attend in person today, again prize to Katie, um, but also all those who've taken time out of their busy schedules to attend and to listen online, you're equally welcome, thank you. Uh, there will be a recording of the live stream for this morning, which is going to be available on our website in due course, uh, and we'd love to hear back on any of the sessions, uh, or if you want to share these with your organisations for those who would be unable to attend today. So we really hope this morning has been useful insightful, inspiring, we hope, and uh, we as MGS are really excited for the journey uh, we're embarking on to deliver the strategy. Creating it has been the start of what will be continuing conversations with the sector and partners, so please continue to speak to us, stay in touch with us, let us know how the work is progressing with the organisations, let us know what's working, what isn't. We're always delightful, delightful? We're always delighted oh, yeah. to hear from you. <laughs> we're always delightful. <laughs> <laughs> and delighted to hear from you. We're, we really want to celebrate your achievements and, and we're here to support wherever we can uh, to do this. So thank you and go well. <laughs>